Hello there, you're watching the Press Preview. A first look then at what is on the front pages. Time to see what's making the headlines with The Guardian's political editor, Pippa Creera, and The Telegraph's associate editor for politics, Christopher Hope. Welcome to both of you. So to the front pages then, let's kick off with The Times. The new submarine cooperation deal between America, the UK and Australia is the lead for The Times, which says Rishi Sunak has done the deal to protect the world against emerging threats in the decade ahead. The Metro says that despite the apparent resolution of the agreement, or disagreement rather, between Gary Lineker and the BBC, there are still calls for the corporation's chairman, Richard Sharp, to resign. The Eye has the headline, pressure grows on BBC bosses over Lineker climb down. The Guardian 2 focusing on that angle of the story. BBC bosses facing pressure, they say. Daily Mail believes that Lineker escaping any form of punishment is an insult to licence payers. Well, the Express goes one step further, suggesting the controversy could mean the end of the licence fee altogether. Here's the Star's analysis of that story, 1-0 to the crisp salesman. The Telegraph, meanwhile, looks ahead to the budget on Wednesday, suggesting the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, intends to raise the tax-free allowance for pensions by more than half a million pounds. The Sun reports that the former pop star Gary Glitter has been put back in prison for breaching the conditions of his licence. And that is also the lead story for tomorrow's Daily Mirror. While the international edition of the FT has more on the fallout from the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. Well, a reminder, by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you listen to our guests. So let's head straight to Pippa and Christopher. Plenty of coverage of, uh, of Gary Lineker, obviously, which we'll come to. But, Christopher, kick off, first of all, with the Daily Telegraph, if you can, uh, looking ahead to the budget. Now, everyone holding their uh, breath, waiting to see what's going to come up. But um, we've heard yes. from Jeremy Hunt suggesting that he's peeling away the layers that stop people working, one of which is pensions. We've seen it in the medical profession with consultants departing the NHS. So what is the plan as outlined in the Telegraph? Well, the plan here is to lift the maximum you can save in a pension, maybe to as much as £1.8 million. It's called the Lifetime Allowance, the LTA. And this is called the so-called doctor's tax. It's a big concern in, in Whitehall. Why do so many consultants leave uh, the NHS so, so soon um, for a quieter life, maybe in the private sector or, or even not working at all? Because um, they, they, get, they, they get capped so much and get taxed so much when they put money into their pension above a certain level. It's a big victory, this, I think, for the Trussites. There's a group, uh, a growth group, uh, the Conservative Growth Group, uh, which has been pushing for this and met uh, with Jeremy Hunt just last week about it. I think this is um, a sop to, to uh, the, the right of the party, who I think should be disappointed in Wednesday's budget. I should say this is the first time we've had a proper budget front page story um, for a few days. We thought we'd be starting these, these stories going back into the weekend, but uh, Gary Lineker, this crisp salesman, got in the way. Uh, absolutely, and we'll come on to that in just a moment. Um, how far does a £1 million pot go? Well, about £30,000 a year uh, for consultants. Many have gone to pharma as well. You said about not working, but some have gone to the pharmaceutical industry. Um, you know, for yeah. them, there was a disincentive to work, and it's removing the disincentives, which is where Jeremy Hunt's focus has been, and the focus, too, of the Work and Pensions Secretary, Pepper. Yes, I mean, much of the focus has been obviously on growth and a key impediment to that has been the number of people in the workforce. Um, and uh, as, as Chris says, and as the Telegraph exemplifies there, uh, a lot of the focus has been get, on getting people, uh, persuading people not to retire so early or indeed to come back from retirement off the golf course. We've heard um, a lot of uh, references to in various speeches from ministers, but actually a much more significant issue is the rising number of long-term sick, people from long-term sick. There are actually fewer early retirees today than there were before the pandemic, um, but but people um, on uh, off on long term sick has risen by more than three hundred fifty thousand since the start of the pandemic, uh, which counts for more than half of the growth in inactivity in, in that period. So um, there's a there's a big pro there's a big problem there as well. And and of course um, Mel Stride, the, the work and pension secretary, is, has been carrying out a review, which we're expecting to hear more from more of um, in, uh, around the time of the budget. 
on Wednesday, uh, looking at different ways to uh, help encourage people back into the workforce. But of course, it's, it's broader than that, because um, many of those who are often long-term sick are men over 50, I and mean, that's specifically is obviously other people as well, but that's a large, a large chunk and disproportionate number of them. And half of those um, are off with, um, it's not just physical ailments, it's also uh, mental health uh, mental health issues. And the support, as we've seen, particularly for mental health provision, has been paired right back. Um, services have been obviously under a lot of pressure uh, coming out of the pandemic, but uh, but nevertheless, services have been paired back. And until you sort of, you deal with the uh, the support that people are getting through the NHS and the and the, the health system, it's very difficult to to sort of you know rejig the the work and pension system uh, to encourage them to incentivize them to come back more. The two things have to go hand in hand. So I expect we'll hear a bit more from that on Wednesday from uh, Jeremy Hunt as well. Yes, and the Telegraph pointing out, um, Christopher, that Mr Hunt's budget will be delivered against a backdrop of a banking industry in crisis. Uh, the Bank of England, the suggestion is, is expected to raise interest rates one more time to 4.25% from a level of 4%, suggesting in America perhaps that interest rates might slow because of the banking issues there. Um, but what else can we expect to hear in terms of how the economy is doing um, and what other issues might we expect to look out for on Wednesday? Well, well, so far, Jeremy Hunt has done what he said he'd do. He forecast a shallow, um, it, well, not even maybe not a recession. He's got away with not having a recession so far, which is some victory from where we were back in November with, with that um, emergency, emergency autumn statement he brought in after the, the Liz Trust uh, quasi Kwatang uh, a debacle. Um, what the big pressure right now is to not go ahead with this increase in corporation tax to 25% next month. Already one tabloid newspaper has started a countdown clock 20 days to catastrophe at the weekend. And that's where the pressure will be on Jeremy Hunt. He had a good day today. He sorted out the, um, the Silicon Valley bank. It was sold for a pound to HSBC with none of our money, and no tax money going to it in the UK at least. But I think things will get harder and harder through the week. The right of the party, I know will not accept um, him going ahead with this increase in corporation tax. But all the guidance is they're going to go ahead with it. They've got about nine billion of headroom to play, play with, and that's it. So I think he's going to let them down. He'll tweak at the edges on allowances, um, what he might call uh, the kind of effective tax uh, um, corporation tax because of the reliefs he can bring in. But I think it won't be enough, and that's the problem he's got. But we are waiting for the so-called rabbit, the Lawsonian rabbit out the hat. We're not sure what it is quite yet. Yeah, I thought Liz Truss killed off the rabbits. But anyway, we'll wait and see, shall we? Uh, never mind <laughs> Too many rabbits. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Never mind corporation tax. Um, there's going to be an alcohol tax rate, according to your paper as well. 45p extra on a bottle of wine. A new system for taxing alcohol coming into effect with stronger drinks to have higher duties. So that would mean 90% of still wines would see an increase in the amount that people have to pay uh, come later this summer. Um, to The Guardian now, your paper, Pippa, and your name on the story, in fact. Um, the Gary Lineker fallout and where it's left BBC bosses. What are you saying? Yeah, well, of course, this all follows the story we've heard so much about over the last few days, uh, which culminated today with the BBC issuing um, an apology for the disruption to sports scheduling over the weekend. Uh, the news that Gary Lineker would be returning, which he welcomed to match the day uh, this weekend coming, uh, and that the BBC is going to conduct a review of its social media guidelines for its stars. But ultimately, it's the, the BBC which comes out of this looking, as one uh, observer uh, as one observer said, Gary Lineker won, BBC credibility zero. Um, they haven't handled this situation well at all, right from the start. Uh, they, there's a suggestion, that, a feeling that they've been on the defensive. Uh, obviously, the BBC is in a position where it's dealing more broadly with an existential crisis because there are those in government and certainly those on the Conservative backbenches that want to um, rip up their, their uh, funding uh, system, the, the license, BBC licence fee, and replace it with another model that they argue is, is more appropriate to um, the way that people consume uh, their, media, uh, their media these days. But um, ultimately, this, this was about, uh, there you go, pictures of Gary Lineker 
uh, being welcomed and selfies taken with him. But um, this was about some comments that he made about the government's small boats policy, about some of the language that ministers had used. Uh, uh, but that's how it started. But it spiralled into a much bigger issue for uh, for the BBC and uh, about its credibility and its impartiality. And today what's happened is that the spotlight has, has shifted firmly onto Tim Davey, the director general, and specifically to Richard Sharp, the BBC chair, who has stayed silent throughout this whole saga, um, but who's already under investigation by uh, the appointments watchdog after it emerged that he helped facilitate a loan agreement for Boris Johnson when he was prime minister just weeks before he was then recommended by Boris Johnson to take on the role of BBC chair. And the suggestion is that he didn't declare this as he may have, as he should have done at the time. Now, if that uh, if that conclusion, uh, the, the appointments watchdog concludes that that is the case, then he's in he's really in a, in a pretty difficult position. As Keir Starmer said um, this morning, an untenable position. And it's really interesting to note that Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt, when they've been asked about him and whether uh, they support Richard Sharp, who was in fact a former boss of Rishi Sunak back in the day at Goldman Sachs and then an advisor at the Treasury, um, whether they've backed him, they've, they've declined to do so. And number 10 today was uh, suggesting that actually we'd have to wait until that appointments watchdog report came out. I mean, that is not exactly a ringing endorsement or uh, you know huge backing for somebody who's already um, uh, in the spotlight for all the reasons that he might not want to be. And it, it, I think it raises questions going forward as, as if that if that the inquiry comes back and is is fairly damning of him, it doesn't sound particularly like the government's going to be willing to leap into his support. Um, so I think his his career certainly uh, still hangs in the balance tonight. Yes, the Metro is certainly featuring uh, Richard Sharp. Time for a sharp exit. Uh, calls for the BBC chief to go over the Lineker uh, fiasco. Tory fury grows that the presenter is still in his job. Uh, beleaguered BBC chairman Richard Sharp, a former Tory donor, as the paper points out, was accused of going missing in action. So the questions continue. Um, Christopher, to your paper and your name on it, um, uh, Lineker has shown he's bigger than the BBC. Tell us more about your argument. Yeah, th th these are comments here. I think what's interesting how, is how this um, debate's run since uh, mid last week. And now finally, we've got some agreement, I think, on it's basically been a massive BBC cock up. Until, until today, um, it was a big debate about whether Lineker was right to compare language um, around this small boats policy to Nazi Germany. Some said yes, some said no, it became a freedom of speech issue. But suddenly it's all coalesced, coalesced in a bit of BBC bashing, which uh, um, Fleet Street uh, seems to be, uh, enjoy doing sometimes across the, the left and right newspapers. I think The Guardian, Telegraph, Mail, broadly similar. Um, yeah, the, these quotes here in the story that we've written today come from um, this new deputy chairman of the Tory party, Lee Anderson, uh, concerned about uh, Gary Lineker and the way he's he really has um, biffed on, on the nose of the BBC, um, and it hasn't been very easy for them. I, I do I disagree a bit with Pippa on the Richard, Richard Sharp issue. Um, I I don't see what he could have done having looked at the story a bit more clo a bit closely. He was essentially was. Um, he came across this a guy who wanted to give money, loan money to Boris Johnson, told Simon Case about it, and then tried to recuse himself from the conversation. Um, he maybe should have told MPs about it when he's appointed, but otherwise, I can't see what he did. And what's interesting about the, the story, I think, is the fact that, as I understand it, uh, Mr. Sharp has not yet been contacted by this inquiry. We're five weeks into it starting. That, for me, says that the, the cabinet office is quite keen to park it in the very long grass even the elephant grass, maybe, so it can't be seen for a while, and hoping this might die away. But with Keir Starmer today um, putting the pressure on to Mr Sharp, it shows it won't go very far. But we've had this debate going back to Gavin Davis 21 years ago. He was made chairman of the, of the, of the BBC. The Tories went bananas. He's a former Labour donor, etc. It just goes round in circles as, as we get older, I'm afraid. <laughs> Yeah, the elephant grass. That's a new one for me. I might uh, add that to my <laughs> array of comments. And uh, just very quickly, let's see the Daily Mail. Um, you know, one of those papers, as you said, who've been hot on this from the very beginning, a slap in the face for BBC licence payers as the Director General caves in and says sorry. Lineker keeps his job and carries on tweeting. Um, you know, in one sentence, Pippa, the Mail has made it quite clear uh, what side of the fence they stand on. Yes, and it's not just about Gary Lineker, it's also about BBC bashing, and they've been bashing the BBC throughout on this one. Yeah.
You, you Disposal might, stop now. You might say for decades, in fact, in some areas, but there we are. <laughs> OK, lots more still to come, uh, including the historic defence agreement between Britain, the US and Australia, that live news conference in San Diego earlier. We'll get uh, into that after the break. Well, welcome back. You are watching the press preview with me once again, Pippa Crira and Christopher Hope from The Guardian and The Telegraph. Uh, Pippa, let's go to the time, shall we? Uh, the fanfare in San Diego tonight with the leaders of Australia, the UK and the United States and a, a massive building programme for nuclear-powered submarines underway um, to keep security effectively in the uh, Indo-Pacific. Um, and effectively, this is aimed at the, the threat of China, is it not? Yeah, I mean, this has been a deal which has been in the offing for, for some months now. I mean, you'll cast your, your mind back to last year when the French got terribly upset that uh, Australia, the US and the UK were, were reaching some sort of trilateral agreement uh, on defence and, sort of, and, and they felt that they were being cut out of it. It caused a, a diplomatic incident at the time, which um, Joe Biden had to smooth over with, with Emmanuel Macron. Um, and this is the culmination of these months of talks, these three men, these three leaders appearing in San Diego in California together um, to strike a deal uh, to build a multi-billion pound fleet of submarines in Britain using US technology that's also being shared with Australia, although I don't think we're going to see more Australian Australia getting nuclear subs uh, um, because of in the uh, is that right? Am I, have I got that right? Yes, that I think they will they will train the Australian Navy to operate nuclear subs, and will de deploy a UK submarine to Western Australia from 2027. But they won't have um, Australian nuclear subs because obviously um, that would be seen as a as a very sort of hostile act by China um, in that in the Indo Pacific in the Indo Pacific region. But it is definitely a result um, for Britain because uh, this this fleet is going to be built in the UK. And potentially, we're seeing a doubling of Britain's submarine fleet, which currently um, is, is seven Vanguard uh, submarines carrying the Trident missile system. The suggestion is that it could potentially uh, more than double um, in the decades ahead. And Rishi Sunak th th says that this is because of a difficult and dangerous decade ahead. We've already seen a sort of a shift in um, in, in the, the geopolitical landscape with Russia invading Ukraine, with China uh, being appearing less willing um, to, uh, or sorry, rather being more willing to sort of, if not overtly support Russia, at least um, there's been some suggestion that they might at some point provide weapons. Um, their involvement in, in, in that conflict obviously would be be very difficult for, for the region to manage. Um, and uh, we saw the we saw the strategic review, the latest tweaks to the strategic review coming out today as well, in which um, Rishi Sunak makes clear, although perhaps not as strongly as some of his backbenchers might like, that China is, of course, the, um, the sort of growing threat in the future that they want to that they want to sort of watch out for. So yeah. um, this is all about um, a, a, an alliance between nations which have obviously a long a long military history, shared military history together, and uh, which obviously share very similar values going forward. Um, and like you say, the fact that it's based on the West Coast, it was announced on San Diego, the West Coast of the United States, um, on the, you know, overlooking the, the Pacific Ocean, um, it was a real sort of indication that that is where these, these, these nations in this particular alliance uh, think that the threat of the future will lie.